and turn to Joshua chapter 4. We are continuing on in our series uh, entitled Memorial Stones, and we are looking at the history of our fellowship, and this is not merely nostalgia, but we are learning lessons along the way in our history. There are foundational stones that we still refer to today. It, it will help you uh, if you're new to understand where we came from, what is important to us, but uh, for everyone, many of the things that we do, things that we are, it helps that you know where they came from. And this is the, the power of memorial stones, and we're looking, using as a, a, our foundational verse, Joshua 4, 4 through 7. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord, your God, into the midst of the Jordan. And each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them, that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it crossed over the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. Okay, we're looking now at uh, early Prescott lessons. We, uh, if you're new here, uh, my father's the founder of our fellowship uh, since passed away, but he came in 1970, and so now we are looking at the history. Uh, our church is intertwined with the Jesus movement that in the late 1960s, early 70s, all across the America there was a national revival, which meant that supernaturally people were drawn to church, people getting saved, primarily uh, hippies, young people, that's where it began, began to spread wider than that. So let's get the first lesson of uh, our church and ultimately our, our fellowship, the lesson is the foundation of conversion. And this is one of the most important lessons about who we are. What are we built on? Conversion. Many churches are built on transfers of Christians from other churches. Uh, I read books and uh, church growth and different things, and they will even tell you how to do programs and how to attract people who are currently already Christians in another church and to get them to transfer to your church. Listen to this, this is a statistic. Uh, they say that only 20% of churches across the United States are growing. Okay, so 80% are not growing, 20% are growing, but only 1% of those churches that are growing numerically are growing by reaching lost people. In other words, by people getting saved. So what that means is 95% of church growth, when they say this church is growing, all they're doing is they are shuffling people they used to go to that church, now they go to this church. Over time, they'll move from this church and go to another one. Listen to me, this is absolutely foundational. Our churches are based on conversion. Sinners turning from sin and turning toward God. Matthew 3, verse 8, this is the biblical foundation. Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Okay, this is now John the Baptist. He said this is what it means is if you are going to uh, identify with God, what does that mean? You turn from sin and you turn towards God. That is genuine conversion. If you, if you start attending church but you still li live like a devil Monday through Saturday, you're not converted. That is not good enough. Uh, if you uh, are just already a Christian, you go to one church and now you come to another one, that's nice. You may come for various reasons. That is not the foundation of our church. In our church, starting in 1970, I've told the story, the, uh, the first hippies to come in, Ron and Susie Burrell, then opened the door to their friends and 
others and, and we began to get this. So what God began to do, my parents came in January, probably late February of 1970, God started saving hippies. I got some uh, photos here, uh, various ones. Here's a later Fair Booth. Uh, these are some of the people, I think that's Margaret Bernal, uh, became Margaret Cutter. And uh, next picture, here is Walter Portugal, one of the early hippies. This is Ron Burrell's half-brother that he came in and got saved. Next picture, here's the clientele we have. Who is that? Al Herman. <laughs> Other churches may celebrate movie stars. This is our clientele right here. <laughs> Al Herman, next picture. Bill Hunt. So now, our, uh, one of our uh, council members now, and uh, God saved him. Next photo, this of course, they came in a few years later. Here's Scott and Laura Flitcroft, uh, real hippies that got saved. Next photo, here's an uh, early band Turning Point. There's Danny on the right, and Scotty, Kathy Corsi, John Rush, and who was that other guy? Is that Morgan? I can't remember if Morgan were to uh, different people. Names go from my mind. So God was saving hippies. God was saving young people. And uh, waves of young people in Prescott High, there was uh, just a, a, a huge number of young people that started getting saved. Uh, got a next photo that we have up here. Here's some uh, various young people ones I recognize, there's Janet Foley at the back, uh, Jill Connolly at the front, some others that I don't remember their names. So God was saving hippies, he was just saving young people going to high school. God was saving parents of young people. Next picture here, uh, this is uh, now Mona Warner. Her mother, Tony Pena, came, Mona and her sister Veronica had gotten saved her mother came, uh, Tony was uh, living with a man and uh, I think maybe he was married to somebody else. My dad didn't do this with everyone, but when she got saved, the night she got saved, he challenged her, you can't keep living like this, you need to move out, she did. Conversion produces life chain. She moved out and lived for Jesus until she passed away a few years ago. So God was saving parents of young people. God was saving some respectable people. Next picture here, Phil and Pat Payson. The picture's a little blurry. This was take a screenshot from a, a home movie. But uh, Phil and Pat, they were not hippies. Their daughter, Janet, was 15. Who, When she got saved, they saw the life change Phil was the president of Antelope Hills Golf Course. He was involved in every kind of civic organization. Respectable people saw what God was doing in their daughter, Janet. So they started coming to church and Phil and Pat would come under conviction. My dad would do the altar call. Hippies and young people are lifting their hands to respond. They would come to the altar, but Phil and Pat weren't like those other people. They were respectable, so they wouldn't lift their hand. And my dad determined, he said, you're going to get saved just like everybody else. We are not making special rules for you. And finally, one day, their pride broke. Phil and Pat Payson, even though they were respectable and religious, knew they were not born again, lifted their hands and came and got saved. And he was an incredible blessing he started the original tape ministry, the trumpet. Uh, he had uh, articles in the paper. There's so many things that he began, but God was saving respectable people. This is the basis of our church. Our church is based on converts. All of our churches, we now have more than 3,400 churches all around the world, all of which originally rooted here in Prescott. And every single one of them has the same foundation, sinners. We aim for sinners. I am not aiming to clean out any church in town. That is not success. Our aim is sinners. 
We preach repentance. Got another photo here. This is a few years later. This is Bob Pepperman. Bob Pepperman was a spooky dude when he got saved, <laughs> but powerfully saved for years, a heroin addict, demon possessed, but God powerfully got him saved. You see there, that's Mark, a young Mark Olson uh, baptizing him uh, there. Our churches are based on converts. Years ago, on one of the tours to Israel, uh, you know, we've done that for years. Rich Cox still continues that. If you'd like to go on a tour, uh, he will be taking that, I think, in November. You can be a part of that. But it's common when we go, there are other church groups that are there, and you'll go to the site, and there'll be buses from some other group. There was another group. I don't know if they were there with Benny Hinn or some other uh, church crowd, and they asked the people in our bus, what church are you from? And they said, we're Christian Fellowship Ministries, the Potter's House or the Door or Victory Chapel. And the people said, oh, the repenters. They were saying it sneering like that was a put down. Yes, they didn't realize. That's a powerful compliment. That is exactly who we are. We are the repenters. Yes, because we are based. Our churches are based primarily and mainly on converts. How many of you here, you were saved in one of our fellowship churches? Lift up your hand. Keep it up. Look around you. Okay, I want you to understand this. The percentage in our churches of people who were saved in our church or in our fellowship, they were sinners, is extremely high. Usually it is 80 to 90% of every church. That is the strength of who we are. We are a fellowship of converts. And so the, the vast majority of our pastors, off the top of my head, I can only think of three of the pastors that I know. Obviously, I don't know all 3,400. But the vast majority of all of our pastors were converts saved in one of our churches. That is, that is who we are. When you have converts, that produces life. You never know what converts will say. Church is a lot of fun when you have raw sinners. When I pastored in South Africa, I had a raw sinner. He came, he sat on the front row. He had never been in church in his life. Everything was new. And I'm, I'm preaching to me. I've known it my whole life. I, you know, God loves you. And on the front row, he would go, Wow. <laughs> out loud you know god has a plan for your life he go wow <laughs> life my observation in any church when you get 20 percent of the church is raw new converts church has a totally different feel it's life and that is also the strength of our churches people who are converted that produces commitment our people are extremely committed because they're grateful. They didn't come because they were church shopping to see, do you give helicopter rides on Easter? Do you give, what, what's your program? They're just glad God saved them, so how can I be a blessing? There's a, 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 a ministry, it's called Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flames. I think it came from the Assembly of God. And uh, we've done it ourselves. We put that on by ourselves, but... How Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames originally worked is, this is somebody had a, a, a vision from the Assembly of God. They have the script, they bring the costumes, and what they do is they'll come to a local church as an outreach, and what they say is, can the church supply actors? We'll give the script, we'll direct it, and then you can use this as an outreach. In one of our churches, they had Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames come, and so... The man comes in advance and they ask for volunteers on the night that they were all supposed to, sh to show up. A huge number of people came to participate and to help. And the man made a very interesting statement. He was blown away at, for the size of the church, how many people showed up. He said, I put this on in mega churches of thousands and it is not uncommon. Sometimes they don't even have enough people to, to have the, as the actors in the whole play. Why? Because those are people, they were already Christians. 
They don't have gratitude. They weren't saved from their sin. That is who we are. The lesson is the foundation of conversion. Second lesson we're going to look at today is the, the foundation of financial breakthrough and dominion. If, if you got saved in our church, you've never gone to another church, you don't understand this perhaps, but it is not uncommon that in many churches, pastors are embarrassed at taking offerings. They're afraid of offending people. They, you know, this is a common statement. We, we, don't, we don't want you to think that we're after your money. That's the dumbest statement. You're taking an offering, but you're saying, we don't want you to think you're after your money. Then why are you up there? Of course we're after your money, if, I'm not talking about personally, but if you're doing a great work for God, why would you be embarrassed to ask people to give money to support it? So it's common, there are churches, they use strategies, there's a box at the back with a hole, you can put your offering in there. And in other churches, when my dad went to Australia, all four square churches then, they had a stick with a big bag, and the point of that was, no one could see what you put in. So you know what people would do? They would just do one of these numbers with empty hand. <laughs> but it, it's so no one sees. We don't want to put anybody on the spot. I've even seen advertisements for churches, no offerings taken here, as though that's a good thing. Okay, the history of the Prescott Church. The Prescott Church had always struggled Financially, I told you when my dad took over the church in January of 1970, it was in debt. They owed money in various ways. The biggest debt was a $350 phone bill. I have no idea how you made it that big in those days, but uh, it was there. Here's, here's a fun fact that some of you might not know. Chuck Smith, who wound up being the founder of Calvary Chapel, he used to be the pastor of the Prescott Church in, I believe, 1960. I even have a, a picture, there's a, a video uh, on YouTube. This is Chuck Smith, if any of you have seen the Lincoln Street Church, that is Chuck Smith when he was the pastor, and that is on the side if you're looking at the building up front, and he is telling the story when he was the pastor, there was a big boulder that kind of, he felt obscured the view, so he said, I'm going to get it card jack and I'm going to jack that boulder out of the way and his wife Kay said if you do that the, the boulder is going to roll into the building he said no nah, it'll be okay and he says that's exactly what happened he jacked it and it crashed through the side wall of the church so my point in telling you this in Chuck Smith's uh, autobiography he says that when he came to, uh, this was actually the first church he ever pastored, and his salary was $15 a week. They were barely making it on $15. Then Kay got pregnant, and they didn't have enough money to, for insurance or, or for the baby or whatever. They said, it's, there's no money here, and we can't afford to live. So they left the Prescott Church and he wound up taking uh, the Four Square Church in Tucson because there was more money. Okay, I'm telling you that story. The church had never supported a pastor fully. When dad took over, it was in debt and one of the money raising strategies for the church is on the 4th of July, they sold tacos. I don't mean to be racist, but white people selling tacos as a money-raising strategy is not a good idea. <laughs> I'm just saying, okay? That's what they did. That's not a good idea. The church struggled financially. 1970, my, my dad took over, and a few months later, he had a revival with John Metzler. This is uh, Jolene. His daughter is in our church and uh, put up a, a next picture here. This is one of the early flyers. I don't think that was the original one. This might have been, we had him often. But this man, John Metzler, he had an absolutely supernatural touch of God. He was used in word of knowledge and healing. He heard from God. John Metzler heard from God in this revival 
in a supernatural way. And in the revival, one of the ways it manifested was in money. John Metzler heard from God. So each night, you know, in every, you're never going to come to a service in the potter's house where we're not going to take an offering. Okay, so dad would take an offering, a regular offering. John Metzler, every single night of the revival, God told him, take a second offering. Now think about this. This goes in the church world. We don't want you to think we're after your money. So visitors are coming in. Not only is there one offering, now there's two. But John Messer did this because he heard from God something broke in the church from that time. My father told me many times through the years, he said, from that revival, something broke Never again did our church struggle financially like that. There was miracle money. That is true to this day. We have been able, we have churches now in 139 nations of the world. Right now we, we have probably close to 25 missionaries that we support fully or partly in addition to churches. And we're putting big money Something broke in the church financially. Not only did something break in the, church, in the church financially, thank God, I think only one more time do we ever try to sell tacos again. We, we don't do that as a money-raising strategy. The only money-raising strategy we have in our church is offerings. We're not selling insurance, burial plans. We have, we have no holy wood or water from Israel. There's... We're not selling anything for you, for the church to make money. That is not what we do. The church was blessed, but people were blessed. It was very interesting. A supernatural dimension happened in, in people's lives. Probably, uh, I lose track of time, but maybe seven years ago, eight years ago, a lady came to church. She came and introduced herself. She doesn't go to our church but she's from the Prescott area. Some of you may know who she is. Her name is Penny Flannery. Penny Flannery was a high school teacher. And when God began to save lots and lots of young people from Prescott High School, they were excited. We talked last week, when people get truly saved, they want to witness. So they started telling Mrs. Flannery about what God was doing in this wonderful revival with this man named John Metzler. And you should come. They were already Christians. They, don't, they had no intention of joining our church, but they came to the, the revival. And so she says, I want to tell you a story. Our church, remember the, the official seating capacity, I think was 65 people. We're jamming, you know, well over 100 by that time are jammed into the building. She said the building was so packed when her and her husband came in, there were no seats together they, she said we had to split up. She sat on one side, sat on the other side. John Metzler, as he did every night in that revival, this is not a program that every evangelist, oh, that's what I'm going to do from now on. Okay, this he heard from God. He pulled a second offering, and remember this is 1970. He said there are a number of people God wants you to give $100 tonight. Again, that was not a gimmick. He genuinely heard from God. And Penny Flannery says, I'm sitting on this side of the church and I felt God tell me that me and my husband should give $100. The problem is he's on the other side of the church and I can't ask him. So she said, I made up my mind, we're giving $100. And John Metzler said, if you're going to give $100, I want you to come down to the front because I want to pray for you. So she said, well, I can't talk to my husband, but God told me, so I'm going. She said, when I got down to the front, God had also told her husband, and we're standing there, and she said, we gave $100. Again, she had, they had no intention of being part of our church. This is now, what, 40, almost 50 years later, she told me this story. She said, something happened that night. Up until that moment, we had always struggled financially. Me and my husband, we never could get ahead. It was like we were almost cursed and, and uh, couldn't be blessed. But she says, that night when we gave 
from that time we have been blessed financially. Okay, something supernatural. That is foundational to who we are. If you were here any of the years my father was alive, you know he was fearless in taking offerings, right? He was not embarrassed at all. As a matter of fact, if he felt resistance in the morning when he preached on money, he's like, he would come back at night and preach on it again because he believed money is supernatural. You can never let the spirit of mammon rule in a church. And he has a son who has the same spirit. I am not embarrassed to take offerings. I am doing you a favor. That's how I view it. Because the blessing of God comes upon giving. And more than that, you know what we do with the offerings. The churches we have planted all over the world, we use it for people to get saved. So it is foundational in our church is the foundation of financial breakthrough and dominion. Third lesson we want to learn from early days is the power of a spiritual connection. My father attended Bible school. And in Bible school, he was taught how do you help people? They, he took classes on counseling. You're going to counsel people out of their problems. And in those days, it was uh, uh, probably the first wave in, in, uh, in churches where they began saying psychology is the way that you help people. My dad took a class. The class was on prayer, but a professor who was teaching these preachers to be he told them, think about this, he's teaching them about the power of prayer, and then he said, prayer is okay, but people need real help. And what he meant by that is if, if people are going to change, they got problems, what you need is you need to counsel and counsel and counsel them, and they need psychology, you got to work out, did your mother not let you throw your oatmeal on the floor, and that's why you're a mess today. My father didn't believe that. He got saved. He was a sinner. When he got saved, and then when he got filled with the Holy Spirit, he said, we're Pentecostals. He said, the power of the Holy Spirit is the answer. And he said, I am not building my ministry or the church on lengthy, repeated counseling and, and uh, psychology. My father believed what people needed was to meet with God for themselves. He, he made a statement. Some of you, if you're around from early days, you heard my father say this many times. God can do more in a few minutes in his presence than we could do in a lifetime. That is how he viewed. And so therefore, he built the church on a foundation People need to get in touch with God. That first of all, how do people get in touch with God? The power of preaching. The power of teaching. The word of God is the answer. Just this morning, a man told me that uh, how much that God helped him through when I taught this series on uprooting rejection. That was not psychology. It was God's word. He said God did something in him of deliverance and, and change, the word of God. My father believed that the word of God is the answer. Secondly, the power of the altar. In the Bible, it speaks many times about altars. An altar is a meeting place with God. That's what it literally meant uh, in early days. My father did a series. They probably have it somewhere in the media room, the altars of God looking at all the different altars that uh, are in the Old Testament. So this is a Bible foundation. Genesis 26, 24, and 25. And the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord, and he pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants dug a well. Okay, look at the Bible progression here. The Lord 
appeared, God revealed something to Isaac. That's what should happen in every church service, right? God reveals something to you from his word about himself, about you in relation to him. And so when God revealed something, what is Isaac's response? Isaac doesn't just go, oh, cool. He builds an altar. So this altar is a place where he, he said, this is where I meet with God. That is what an altar did. I'm meeting with God here. But what you are doing, it becomes a place, a, a reference point. From this time, things are going to be different. And the Bible then says the actions. He pitches a tent. He digs a well. Because I met with God here, I build an altar and now I am going to live differently because of what happened. That is the principle of the altar. In every single one of our services, we have altar calls. When the preaching is done, we will have people bow your heads. First of all, we want sinners to meet with God. Every single time you come, we always have an altar call. If you ever come here and we don't have an altar call, that means the pastor is sick. There's something wrong, right? Because that is who we are. It would not be right to have possibly sinners here and not give them a chance to meet with God to get saved. But we also do something in our church is we then, we open the altars for believers. If God spoke to you, you're already saved. You're not coming to the altar to get saved. You're coming to the altar to do what Isaac did. God, I heard your voice. You spoke to me about my sin, my situation. You, you told me something about yourself. So you come to the altar and you talk to God. The point of church is not just open your notebooks or open your electronic device, take notes, interesting information about God. No, you need to meet with God. Powerful things happen in Altar times, people are changed. You got a, got a picture, uh, various pictures. This is what happens in every single one of our services is Christians come to the altar to meet with God. I heard your voice. I'm going to act on it. Help me. But the main thing, they are talking to God because that is the point of an altar. So that is the second way. Preaching and teaching is number one. The word of God is how people meet with God. Number two, the power of the altar. Thirdly is the power of a personal relationship with God. What did my father do through the years? You need to read your Bible yourself. He used to say, back before we had electronic devices, how many of you brought your Bibles? And he would say, how do you know if the preacher is preaching from the Bible if you don't read it for yourself, right? This is powerful. Every believer needs to read your Bible. You need to read it for yourself. And every believer needs to pray. We have prayer here every morning, Monday through Saturday. You start early, you can come early. You need to pray. I know you can pray at home, but let's be honest, some of you, you won't. But we give an opportunity. Come, there's power in corporate prayer. Come before service. Tonight, our service starts at 6.30 before every evening service. We have evening prayer. The point of that is not just that the program is, uh, that's on the schedule. It's who we are. You need to touch God for yourself. And this is absolutely foundational. If you don't have a relationship with God, all the counseling in the world is not going to help you. That's why people come and they go, I got problems with it. You will have pastors that will ask you, do you read your Bible and pray? That, that's not, we're not doing that for statistics. We want to know because if you're not reading your Bible and prayer, counseling is not the answer. Counseling can be helpful. There's something you can't work out. Absolutely. Get a pastor. Get some counseling. That's great. But if you don't have a relationship with God yourself, we're just flapping our gums. We all have better things to do with our time. 
You, that is foundational to who we are. You need to be in church to hear the word of God. That's how you're meeting with God. You need to come to the altar. Some of you, it's been a long time since you prayed at the altar. You need to meet with God at the altar and you need a personal relationship. And so this, when you have converts who have a relationship with God, it produces life. Let's just see the video. Here's the original building in Lincoln Street. God bless Phil Payson. He had a little Super 8 movie camera. And here is an early service. These are sinners. Save the life of God, the joy of God as they are entering into the presence of God. That little building was jam-packed. There's Rodney lifting his hand, Rodney Mathis, from the early days, numbers of people that you might or might not recognize if you were from those days. But here is the life of God. I believe that's uh, David Rice. That's Donna's brother there at the front. Come down. Life and sinners, uh, Bev Coolidge. You see her waving her hands there. There's Linda Lee back there in love with Jesus. Sinners saved by grace, that is the life of God. And that is the foundation of our church. Oh, look, at there's Pastor Greg as a young boy. <laughs> I did have hair, you know. People doubt that, but I did. There's my dad in his fashion sense, and there is Larry Reed, who is there for revival, and Sister Sharon. Thank God for what he has done in our church. Isn't that wonderful? Thank you, Jesus. Okay, let's move on. Next lesson. Next lesson of our history is sending life to those who don't want it. Think about this. Revival broke out in our church. My dad, this was his dream come true. My parents were sinners. They got powerfully saved from sin. Dad was so excited, so they were a part of the Foursquare denomination my dad told everybody. He wanted everybody to experience what we were, what you just saw there. He's like, who would not want that? The life of converts. You can have this. So, and he would offer to his pastor friends in different churches, we will come help you to have what we have. This is, uh, this is the idea. We could take what we have to another place. So he arranged to do a concert for his home church that he had gotten saved in, the Foursquare Gospel Church in Phoenix, Arizona. So we loaded people up in vehicles. I don't even think we had a church van at that time. People drove. This was actually our very first impact team. We were going there back in the day. Dad ultimately dubbed it Gorilla Teams. Gorilla, G-U-E-R-I-L-L-A. When I was a little boy, like, why are we sending apes? I don't, I didn't get that. <laughs> the whole gorilla thing. And so we're going to do a concert at night. And so what we did is we went to Encanto Park in Phoenix, and uh, we did an outreach. We did preaching. We did witnessing. We actually have a, a, a video. I don't think this is the original one, but this is in Canto Park. If they'll play this, there's Janet Foley witnessing in Encanto Park. She'd have just still been a teenager at that time. And that is uh, Janet witnessing. Is that the whole video? Is that the only one we have? That's the only one. Okay, so that's just uh, there and, and Janet witnessing. So that night, the idea is we witness during the day, exactly like we do today as an impact team, and we invited, we passed out flyers of some kind to come to uh, the church that night for a concert, and just like, God was doing this all across America, just like in Prescott, a bunch of raw sinners came and jammed. If I remember right, they had... Uh, almost a hundred sinners come. Hippies, raw. Some of these people were crazy, but they came. My dad was so excited. This is the church he got saved in. It's like 
Yes, sinners came. The people who witnessed, they were excited. Yes, sinners like us came. The people in the church were not excited. My dad's niece was in the church. She said, Wayman, I sure hope you know what you're doing. <laughs> when she saw all these sinners, she was not excited. After a ton of them got saved, but he was told by the pastor of the church, these are not the type of people we're looking for here. I told you last week, that is what happened all across America. The fact that hippies came in was not unique to us. It happened in many, many churches. So think about this. We offered the life of God and they didn't want it. They said, no, thank you. They didn't want sinners in their church. Phoenix was not the only place. We did it in several other cities where dad would be excited. He would offer to the pastor, we'll bring a band, we'll bring people, we'll witness, we'll do everything to help. But this became very frustrating to my father to learn that many people did not want sinners in their church. So when sinners came, the people in the church rejected them. They would be rude to them or would be cold to them because we don't actually want those. They're ruining our nice church. That's how they viewed it. That's very frustrating. So we could labor and labor during the day and during the night only to discover that the church would kill those converts. They would not stay saved. Or in some instances, some people miraculously did manage to stay saved, but some of those churches then believed strange doctrine. So now you have these people, if you met them later on, like, man, you, you believe whacked out things. Where'd you get that? The church that we labored and sent the sinners to. So dad began to have the idea, and we'll, this will be developed later on. He said, the only way this is going to work, we need people in each city we're going to labor in, we need them to love what we love, which is sinners. We need them to believe like we believe. But my dad had no idea how could that work because if not, we're sending life to people who don't want it. My dad didn't know what the answer was, but he said clearly this is not working to have people reject them or have them be become strange. So foundational in our church from the early days, we would send people to other cities to evangelize. We do have a picture of one of the first, what they called guerrilla teams. This is a bus. Uh, I can't remember if we bought this or rented it, but here is an early impact team going to another city to witness that is foundational. Every one of our fellowship churches around the world, the Potter's House, the Door, Victory Chapel, whatever name they go by, they're part of our fellowship. To this day, they still do this. They send life to other cities. That's good if you have somebody in the city who will love what you love and believe what you do. But unfortunately for us, in the early days, a lot of our impact teams, they were wasted. And that became a foundational lesson. I'll develop that later on. Final lesson in who we are, and this has to do with discipleship, versus Bible schools. Hippies started getting saved. Young people started getting saved. They have the life of God like you saw there. A natural part of people getting saved is they want to be used by God. I want to do something for God. And they began to ask the question, how can I be used by God for a greater future? If God has something larger for me, some of them began to say, I think maybe God wants me to be a preacher, so how would I ever get there? In the earliest days, my dad gave converts who wanted to be preachers the only advice he knew, you should go to Bible school. Because that's how my father, when he got saved and was excited, his pastors told him that 
that you should go to Bible school. That's what he did. And so in the earliest days, we had two different young men. That's what they did. They went to Bible school, two different Bible schools. One almost backslid completely. At Bible school, I told you some of my father's experiences when he was at Bible school. These were not, fine, you know, all fine Christians wanting to do the will of God. Often it was Christian parents whose kids were getting into sin and they thought to save them, I want to send them to Bible school. So now we have a genuine convert. He goes to Bible school and he's with, actually he's going to class with sinners. Just like the life he used to come out of, they're going to school because mom and dad are paying for it, but they actually wanted to still live in sin one man came back, he almost backslid completely at Bible school. Another man did go to Bible school, and when he came back, he had some very strange ideas, believed some false doctrines. So my dad began to come to the conclusion, he first of all is examining his experience with Bible school that he didn't feel was a positive experience. Now he's looking at these young men, and he knew this is going to happen more and more. Young people are going to want to do the will of God. Am I going to send them away to backslide or send them away to become... And he said, the only way this is going to work, we have got to somehow train young people, young couples, we need to train them here in the church to be men and women of God. My father, uh, I touched on this in an early lesson, but I'll repeat it now. He came to the conclusion the entire premise of Bible school he felt is flawed. It's actually unbiblical. Here's the problem of Bible school. Number one, often those teaching are men who didn't succeed at pastoring. Right? It didn't work for you. You never, were never able to build a church. So the old saying, those who can do, those who can't teach. That's what my father is. So in other words, how can you learn how to be a successful pastor from someone who's never done it himself? So he's, that doesn't make logical sense. Number two, Bible school ignores character. How do you pass Bible school? Pass tests. You, you sit for the correct number of credit hours. If you can pass a test, you get the diploma. You are now officially a pastor but it completely ignores character. You can be beating your wife, right? You can, you can be immoral, but I passed the test. You can be rude to people, have no people skills, but I passed the test. You're in, you're a pastor. He said, that doesn't make sense because character is the foundation of being a man of God. Thirdly, Bible school removes man from, uh, uh, the, uh, the man from people. Pastoring is all about people. So for three or four years or however long you go to Bible college, you now are in a classroom, supposedly with other Christians or professors. You're not with people. Number one, you're not learning how do you work with new converts and establish them in the faith because you're not involved with them. You're taking classes and tests. Number two, you're not working with people. How is character developed with other people? There are people that call it, Pastor, I'm in a band. That guy really bugs me good that's how you learn character it's that's how you change you 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 think you're wonderful you start getting around other people that i want to kill them like there's apparently it's things you need to work on right bible school takes you away from that and then fourthly bible school is not connected to evangelism biblically jesus sent his disciples out to evangelize that is how you learn, truly, is when you are working with new converts, when you're dealing with sinners and getting them saved. So, so my father examining that, he began to say, biblically, there aren't Bible schools in the Bible. As a matter of fact, you can say the sons of the prophets, some uh, translations say school of the prophets. You can do your own research in Elijah's time. They were all unsuccessful. None of them ever became a prophet that we know of, right? 
the Jews had scripture schools, but that's not the plan that Jesus used. Jesus worked one-on-one -on -one with uh, 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 young men. So my father began to understand God's plan is young men, young couples connected to a man of God and trained by a pastor. That's actually God's plan. Secondly, you want to do something for God, you need to be involved in evangelism. Young people come to me, I want God to use my life. You need to get involved in evangelism. You need to be personally witnessing. You need to go on impact teams. You need to go on outreaches because that is how you will grow. Thirdly, it is based on character, not passing tests. You have to have character. You can, you can be brain smart, but if you have bad character, you shouldn't be a man of God. Simple. You can have talent oozing from your pores. If you don't have character, you're not going to last and you're going to hurt people. You shouldn't be a man of God. Character. But you learn that in discipleship connected to a man of God in a local church. And fourthly, you need to work with people. I want God to use my life. Work with people. Work with new converts. There's something powerful about that. And this became absolutely foundational. Next week, we'll, we'll get into uh, planting churches or in our, in our next lesson. Remember, my father had received a word. We have it here on the screen. This is from my father's Bible. You'll notice, look at the bottom. Mills, this is a man named Dick Mills. He got this word in July of 1967. This is three years before he came to Prescott. It's Isaiah 58, 12. This man was saying, this scripture will be the mark of your ministry. They that shall be of you or come from you will build up the old waste places. You'll raise up the foundations of many generations. You'll be called the repair of the breach, the restorer of the paths to dwell in. One of the powerful things of my father's ministry, it was the restoration. He didn't invent it. Jesus did. But he restored discipleship. How do you become a man of God in a local church? Not shipping you off to Bible school. And this is foundational. More than 3,400 all around and as far as I know, I only know of three of the 3,400 that ever went to Bible school. Every single one of them, sinners saved. That's the first foundation. And then they're discipled in a local church by a man of God in fulfillment exactly in God's word. That is the old foundation. Those are old paths. But God used my father. This is the foundation of who we are to this day, you have seen we have powerful men of God that preach behind our pulpit. All of our staff, not one of us, have gone to Bible school. Tonight, we're going to have from another nation, from Mexico, Jose Luis Gaiola is going to preach tonight. He did not go to Bible school. And yet, people are saved and healed and delivered and lives are changed. That is who we are that is a memorial stone. We need to give God praise and thank God for his goodness. Thank you, Jesus, for your goodness, Lord God. You let us be a part of it. Thank God. We're going to stop there at 1030. Our morning service will begin. God bless you.